Just wait a few more minutes so that for people to uh, drift in. Uh, thank you. Oh, you have a PowerPoint. Yeah, that's a good. Very good. Thank you. Another two, three minutes and then uh, start. Sure. Okay. I'm Holly Svandieri, the director of the uh, Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. It gives me a great uh, pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Ms. Heba El Kutsi, who is a visiting Arab uh, journalist at the uh, Wilson Center. Um, each year, uh, the Middle East program at the center selects an Arab uh, journalist uh, from the region to come and uh, spend uh, three months at the center. Um, journalist is in residence, and they they usually carry out. Uh, their own policy-oriented uh, research and writing. And at the end of their stay, they put together a 20 to 25-page uh, uh, paper. Um, this program was made possible by the generous financial support provided by uh, Dr. David Ottaway a senior scholar at the Wilson Center and a, a very uh, famous journalist in this town. We are uh, thankful to him for making this possible and for his support. Uh, uh, Heba El Kutsi is the second Arab journalist. We had journalists last year from uh, uh, Lebanon. Uh, Heba is an Egyptian journalist with 15 years of experience in uh, print media. Uh, she started her career uh, working for Akhbar al Yom newspaper, Al Jamhuriya, and Al Ahram daily uh, newspaper. Uh, she concentrated first on women uh, and youth issues and won a prize from the United Nations for uh, her uh, coverage of the Women's Conference in Beijing in 1995. Um, in 2000, uh, she started to uh, work with uh, al Sharq al Awsat, covering uh, international conferences and reporting on political and economic events in Egypt. Um, uh, she was later uh, promoted to work uh, at the al Sharq al Awsat's headquarters in London, and in 2007 she became the first woman and the youngest to be appointed to head up a business section 
in a Kuwaiti newspaper, Awan. Uh, currently, she's working with Al Masr Al Yom, uh, which, as you know, is a liberal, privately owned newspaper in Egypt with a large uh, circulation. Her research at the center is about democracy and uh, will be published as a book in Egypt. Today she is going to speak on democratization as a source of tension between the United States and Egypt. She will speak for 30 to 35 minutes and then take uh, questions. Heba, we are delighted to have you with thank us. Thank you, thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, Wood Wilson Center for being very supportive and uh, all the support I got from Ms. Halas Pendari and from every pe all the people in the center. It was an enormous support and thank you for all. Thank you for coming. Um, Actually, uh, this, this paper is about democracy in Egypt and uh, the relationship between Egypt and the United States. Egypt is considered the uh, largest uh, political force in the Middle East. And uh, the American-Egyptian uh, relationship witnessed what's called tension within the Bush administration um, and after the 9-11. And what Bush uh, tried to spread, or the, the freedom agenda that Bush adopted in 2000, after 2001. Uh, my paper, or my research, uh, is going to look on the pressure placed on the Egyptian government and the, from the Bush administration. Uh, this pressure was to push the government to adopt democratic steps especially in the arena of human rights and political reform. What I actually found is that uh, President Mubarak did some reforms. One of the most important steps is that he announced the first, Egypt's first multi-candidate election, presidential election in February 2005. It was a major step and the most important one. Uh, another step was the establishment of the National Council for Human Rights was, a positive, was another positive step. But the question is, was it a response to the American pressure or as most of the expert, American experts told me as I've done several interviews here asking American experts and people, officials from the administration whether it, whether it a response to this pressure or not. On the other hand, uh, Egyptian officials assured that it was a response to the Egyptian people call for democracy. Uh, I, I have to say it's not easy to, to catch step taking and attribute them to a particular pressure. However, at the end, what all this pressure have to do with Obama's administration and this increasing debate about the next presidential election in 2011 and the possible candidates that every, everyone in Egypt is debating now who's going to be our next president. Egypt and U.S. It's always been a U.S. strategy towards Egypt to maintain uh, regional stability, to improve bilateral relations, to continue my, uh, military cooperation and sustaining the Egyptian-Israeli peace process. All the previous administration kept that policy. It, it maintained to have a steady, a steady relationship with Egypt politically and uh, militarily. Only uh, Bush administration uh, was the unique administration or the, the only exception that has what is called tension between Egypt and uh, U.S. and that's because of the calls of democratization. Um, in spite of this uh, tension between the two countries, Actually, uh, President Mubarak maintained a, a very good cooperation between Egypt and United States. It was uh, uh, the uh, President Bush and President Mubarak 
had several meetings with very welcoming notes and very welcoming cooperation. And the Middle East peace process was always the first priority in their talks. They, they, they always discussed the Middle East process. And his visit to Washington, President Mubarak, in, in March 2002 and in June the same year, it was the first priority to discuss this issue. Within the eight years of uh, Bush administration, there were a lot of events in, in, in Palestine. There were the second intifada in 2000. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas came to power in 2005 after the death of Yasser Arafat. The Israeli withdrawal from Gaza Strip in August 2005. Hamas winning the election in 2006 and the war in Gaza in 2008. Within all these events, there was, there was a, a cooperative uh, negotiation between Egypt and the United States. There were ongoing talks and cooperation. And this is another question, how you maintain this cooperation while you have having tension between the two uh, states. Another issue of cooperation was Iraq, Sudan, and Afghanistan. And it were, it, these issues were, were always on the mutual talks. Egypt supported uh, the American goal several times, a training of Iraqi police in 2005, deployment of military personnel in Darfur, sending medical and military hospital staff in Afghanistan, uh, transit of U.S. naval vessels uh, through the Suez Canal and security support to, to these ships, Overflight permission of U.S. military aircraft in the Egyptian uh, airspace, besides the uh, biannually exercised bright stars between Egypt and the United States. What makes this relation really witness some tension? It was democracy, human rights. Democracy, the uh, United States called for Egypt to show the way towards democracy the role of wall, the limit of the power of states, the respect of women, equal, uh, equal rights, the, the respect of private um, property, free speech, equal justice, all this. But actually, uh, President Mubarak's response is to reject all the pressure from the United States part to, to democratize. He described it as an interference in the inter internal affairs. On the human rights violation in Egypt, there were two uh, uh, important uh, cases. One of Saad Din Ibrahim, he's a, a sociologist with dual American uh, Egyptian uh, citizen and head of Ibn Khaldun Institute. He was sentenced to seven years in prison for transitioning uh, Egypt image. And the other one was Ayman Noor case. He's a political MP and head of al Ghad opposition party. He was accused of forgery and sent to prison for five years. It was actually several calls from uh, international uh, organizations just like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, they apply, uh, applied to President Bush to call President Mubarak to for torture and human rights abuses in Egypt. Uh, the response of the State Department to these uh, cases like Ayman Noor and Saad Din Ibrahim was by publicly announcing that the state is very um, disappointed, uh, very concerned. She's asking the Egyptian government to re-examine the issue. But actually, the Egyptian uh, response to these quotes or these appeals is to reject them all. It's even uh, once when uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice hinted that she may not, she, she may not attend uh, an upcoming meeting in, in Cairo uh, with the Arab League uh, if uh, Ayman Noor case is not solved. So President Mubarak responded by canceling the whole meeting. Uh, actually, President Mubarak rejected all calls for releasing Ayman Noor or Saad Din Ibrahim at that time, because he was actually, he ordered to, to release them uh, as a, some kind of uh, cooperation with the new administration and Obama. 
But actually, it's not, it's not only the Bush administration that wanted to see political change in Egypt. There, is, there were several elements. Uh, the regime was feeling pressure from, uh, from below, from a rapidly, uh, a rapidly expanding wave of young people who were fed up and who were calling for a real democratic reform. There were several demonstrations for wages raised and improving for standard of, of living, calls for, from intellectuals in Egypt. Uh, for the independence of judiciary, calls for putting, putting an end to the state of emergency in Egypt. Calls, these calls even came from the Mubarak owns political establishment. It came also from the National Democratic Party, and that was a slight change. There was some opponents in the establishing in establishing private newspaper, and my El Masri Lyom newspaper is one of the recent. Uh, privately owned newspaper. There was also a TV private channels. And the internet revolution with bloggers expressing their views and their discontent. Another change was uh, the new government headed by Dr. Nazif in 2004. And this government succeeded in achieving some economic reform. In January 2005, the Egyptian opposition formed a coalition to call for reform, lifting of emergency law and restri uh, restrict uh, politic activity and con constitution change to limit the next president's uh, power. This call was again rejected by President Mubarak. He said that there is no need to change the constitute, constitution. Uh, he told reporters he was traveling to uh, an African summit in um, uh, the 30th of January 2005, and he told the journalist uh, accompanying him that uh, the current system of having the parliament choose the president has kept Egypt stable, and that demand for constitutional change was pointless. That was in January, late January 2005. In in February uh, 22nd, uh, 2005, in Monofei University, just three weeks after this announcement to, to, to the reporters, President Mubarak announced that he will ask the parliament to change the constitution and permit multi-party popular election. He said that the decision was rooted to his full conviction to consolidate effort for more freedom and democracy. So what happened in these three weeks from his previous uh, announcement to, to, to the reporters and this public announcement to change the constitution is still a big question whether it a respond to the American pressure or a respond to uh, the Egyptian pressure. Actually, according to the interviews I had uh, with the American expert, they confirmed that was a response to the, pre to the American pressure. But on the other hand, the, the Egyptian official assured that there were some kind of a meeting between Safwat Sharif, head of the lower house, and the opposition parties. And this was uh, the demands of the opposition parties. Anyway. Um, uh, this agenda of freedom has caused the tension. So it's, the question is what was right and what was wrong about the, the American pressure on Egypt? What was right and what was wrong on the, of the Bush administration? Uh, Marina Otway, a uh, democracy specialist in Carnegie Endowment, mentioned that uh, President Mubarak is not a dictator. Uh, the presidential system in Egypt gives the president, whoever he is, an enormous amount of power. Calling for democracy means giving up a, a, a great deal of this power. And who would give who would give up his power like that? She doesn't expect a revolution or a conflict between uh, the Egyptian public to push the government to take the most democratic steps, as it happens in several uh, Eastern Europe countries. 
She points that uh, the public pressure is the only powerful measure to force the government to give up some of its power. But uh, the opposition in Egypt, she mentioned, is very weak and it lacks uh, uh, organizational skills. Other reasons is that the Egyptians, she put another two reasons. The Egyptian security forces is very efficient and the government's top priority is maintaining security. Number two is that uh, Egypt's polit uh, political opposition is very weak and uh, has a lack of uh, organization skills. There is no secular opposition and the only organized opposition in, in, in Egypt is the Muslim Brotherhood. But still, Otway doesn't consider the Muslim Brotherhood to be a viable threat to the current Egyptian uh, regime. Their success in gaining uh, 88 seats in the parliament in 2007, that's some kind of a 10 percentage of the 23 percentage of the people who voted in, in the election. So it's, it's a very minor percentage. The theory behind Bush administration is that uh, the lack of democracy is the main cause of, ter of terrorism is right. But the ignorance or, um, of imposing the American model was wrong. Uh, I had an interview with Graham Bannerman. He's a Congress, uh, Congress, uh, uh, Congress lobbyist for Egypt. He said that it was right to push for uh, to push the, the Egyptian government to adopt democratic steps, but the tools used is not right. He advised his, he gave an example that criticizing President Bush in uh, President Mubarak in public isn't right. That if he if he responded to this pressure, that will make him weak in the in the eyes of the Egyptian people, and this is not acceptable. So he advised to keep on pressing, pressing, but uh, inside uh, inside closed doors. Um, for Elliot Abrams, former director of the National Security Council, he said that Bush administration was dealing with autocratic and dictat dictatorship countries and criticizing them will only raise uh, tension. So the lack of tension means that the American administration is not pushing hard enough for democracy. And he advised that the Secretary of State should mention E these, these issues every time she meets with Ahmed Abulgaid, the Egyptian foreign minister, and making his visit to the states unpleasant. Abrams believed that if it wasn't for the U.S. pressure on Egypt, Mubarak regime would have never done or committed all these reforms. In his opinion, that President Mubarak is a good ruler and a good person. But he had three decades to prepare Egypt to, for democracy and still done nothing. Mubarak, as Abraham says, truly doesn't believe that Egypt needs democracy, as democracy will lead the country to chaos and instability. So what's the Egyptian reaction to this uh, pressure? There were two different or uh, some kind of two uh, reaction from the Egyptian side or from the Egyptian official regarding democracy uh, promotion. One is defeating the current uh, situation, denying any lack of democracy or any lack of uh, human rights. The other, the other uh, opinion was that Egypt is facing some challenges and She's taking some steps in political and economic reform by itself and without any pressure. In, in, uh, I had an interview with Dr. Ahmad Fathi Srur, head of the Egyptian parliament, and he told me that Egypt has all rights to protect itself and the people from terrorism. With, a count, uh, with a continuing of the emergency laws for more than 20, 28 years, he insisted that Egypt on her way in adopting her own democracy. When I asked him how long will it take uh, to, uh, to, to, to this full democracy, he said he was angry. He replied angry. Who said we are not democratic? We are, uh, we are democratic in the way that suits the challenges we face. 
So Egypt is enjoying the type of democracy that suits its circumstances and its challenges. On the other uh, opinion, uh, Mr. Mustafa Said, he's a former minister and uh, member of the parliament, he said that there is three reasons that pushes Egypt to adopt democratic steps. First is a growing and powerful private sector in Egypt, and this private sector is pushing the government to adopt uh, more democratic or more uh, reforms in, in both political and economic. Number two is the power of the middle class and the intellectual who are discussing critical issues of reform, and this debate is increasing in Egypt. Number three, and this is very important, is that Egypt in, is in need of uh, attracting foreign investment and that require a strong justice system and free media. He added that the most practical way to achieve democracy is by, is by empowering political parties in Egypt. So it's, uh, why this is, uh, a critical time to move quickly. So we understand that uh, the reasons was for democracy and the Egyptian reaction. But this coming two years is very crucial. In spite of the 50% illiteracy in Egypt, Egypt is considered a natural place for transition to democracy in the Middle East. Uh, it's moderate society, educated elites, strong national identity, and long tradition of secular rule. But do Egyptian people want democracy? Are they willing to fight for their democracy? It's another question. You can't get democracy in, in a silver plate. So are they willing to fight for their fight for democracy or not? Um, this time within, we are going to witness a, a presidential election in 2011 and a parliament election in 2010. It, it, Egypt is in the middle of a debate over the next presidential election with a possibility with raising uh, names like Gamal Mubarak, like Mohammed al Baradi, like several names of the uh, famous elite in, uh, figures in Egypt. But uh, Abrams, uh, Eliot Abrams says the important question isn't about who's, who's next, who's coming after Mubarak. It's not the question. The question wh wh whether it will be Gamal Mubarak, his son, or anybody else. The question is, is he going to be there in presidency for six years for one term, or for two terms, 12 years, or for 40 years? That's the question. What can the Egyptian people uh, do to force the coming president to uh, promise for uh, reforms and uh, really do something regarding this uh, emergency law, regarding the, the presidency uh, limits and all the, the articles, uh, then constitution reforms regarding article uh, 67 and 77 and 173 and all these articles. Um, whether Al Baradai or Gamal Mubarak or anyone else, uh, it would represent a crucial institution change to Egypt order. It's a, it's for the first time in modern era that the military uh, establishment would be separated from the presidency, and this is a good another good point. The civilization, the civilian civilization of Egyptian presidency is necessary for demo democratic change, but it's not efficient by itself. So, the conclusion uh, is that we have witnessed in 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 our history that it's always the president. It's Egypt has enjoyed uh, a real democratic life in the 20s and the 30s of the last century. Under the, the, the British occupation, it, there were uh, three main players in political life, the, the occupation, the British occupation, the king, and the left party. And it was the, the British occupation allowed some freedom to, and some political freedom in, in Egypt. And when it comes to, uh, uh, after the revolution, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser prevented all this political, uh, political uh, freedom and uh, Anwar Sadat 
uh, permitted it. So it's some kind of, that's the president power, where it's the occupation, the authorities, the president, the ruler, who usually permit or prevent uh, political reform or uh, political freedom. This pyramid model coming from top to bottom, allowing or coming from uh, uh, the ruler uh, control the Egyptian life. It's the president who allow or prevent this political reform. What I need now, or what I'm suggesting in my research, it's the need to another pyramid model coming from the bottom, it's like that, coming from the bottom, coming from the ordinary people to the top. It's becoming more effective, helping Egyptian people to recognize their rights and organize their effort and call for their rights, helping Egyptian civil society to, in calling for political reform, respect for human rights, is the best model that Obama's administration should look at. What's needed from Obama's administration? There is a need to continue pressure on the Egyptian government, but through praising president, through uh, uh, praising them for adopting uh, democratic effort and asking on the same time for more steps. There should be uh, some issues that should be addressed, limiting presidential power. The president, uh, according to the Constitution, has something around 63% percent of the power in his in his hand, so he has an absolute power. And setting terms for presidency, reforming government restriction uh, required in registering uh, civil society organization, reforming re uh, registra uh, restriction on establishing political parties. Actually, United States and Obama's administration should lobby the Egyptian government to cancel emergency law to seek for uh, a reform plan to distribute the power of the president hand and to hand it to the legis le legislative and judiciary authorities in Egypt. And the torture, extra legal physical abuse, uh, mistreatment of political opposition prisoners and uh, restraint judicial oversight of the electric, uh, electrical process. There is also a need to push for religious freedom and tolerance with minorities such as the Copts, the Baha'i, and even the secular people or unreligious people. Uh, article 179 is also need to be changed. It's an article that allows the president to put civilians in front of military courts in, in cases of uh, uh, terrorism. Egypt always said that it doesn't respond to the external uh, uh, pressure, so it must be Egyptian call to, for more democratic steps. This will happen by strengthening the NGOs, the civil society and the human rights societies in Egypt. In doing so, they will provide sharp pressure from inside the Egyptian society, from the top up, and this will require long-term and short-term goals. For the long terms, and this is my final recommendation, this will require reforming the education system, training a, a teacher, uh, reforming the cu curriculum of the, of the subject, building, even building schools will help. And presenting new education program with critical and independent thinking methods for, for pupils. The media must stand up for the, pre, for the freedom of speech in addition to training journalists to address topics that will help promote the awareness of the human rights and democracy. Empowering women, which is an, a very Im important issue. No country can be democrat democratized or can be uh, described as fully democratic if part of this of its population is discriminated against or denied equal uh, rights. Egypt implement policies to improve hum women rights, such as the, the establishment of the National Council for Women, and uh, it's recently set a quota for women and uh, in the Egyptian par uh, Parliament. This doesn't reflect the respect of the women in the in the in the 
in the society. It's just some kind of cosmetic reform. Um, f issues that needed to be addressed is are providing le legal and uh, financial education um, assistance to poor women in Upper Egypt. That would be very helpful. It's not a matter of uh, holding conferences of empowering women and all the people that attend these conferences is from the elite. It's, it's very uh, crucial to help the poor women to get legal assistance. Other laws that need to be considered is those regarding marriage, divorce, and inheritance. Religion, political opponents uh, that will lead for more radical, may lead for more radical followers. Perhaps this would be uh, some kind of a danger that this opens, uh, opening to the world will, will make some people more radical. But this requires program design to build ties and communication with the secular community in addition to promoting a successful model of Islamic countries such as Indonesia and Turkey. Um, last, last thing to end up with my lecture. Uh, is that some kind of a joke when, when Gamal Mubarak ca came to uh, his father's, uh, telling him, I'm ready now to rule Egypt. So his father told him, no, you're not. Uh, he told him, I'm ready. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, to give people freedom. I'm going to rule in a democratic uh, way. I'm going to open up with the whole world. Everybody will, will have the freedom to express himself. Also, Hasni Mubarak rejected and he told him, no, you're not. So Gamal was very angry and he told him, prove I'm not. So he just uh, called some of his bodyguards. He came up with a box with 80 chickens in it. He told him, that's Egypt. Show me how you are going to rule it. So Gamal Mubarak opened the box and all the chicks went out running here and there. And so... Uh, Mubarak told him, okay, you open up for the world, get them inside. So it was hard for Gamal to collect <laughs> all the chicks and get them inside the box. So he proved that he's not ready. So Gamal told him, show me how do you rule Egypt. Okay, he called some of his guard and he got him another box with 80 chickens in it. And so President Mubarak hold the box and check it very, very hard several times. And he put it in the table and open it. And no chick was able to get out of the, of the box. It's how you rule Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much. We'll, we'll uh, open uh, the floor to uh, your uh, questions. Um, I'm, I'd like to start with the first question. Uh, Heba, on the one hand, uh, uh, you said that uh, necessarily the Egyptian government does not react to pressure from the outside, and you cited the example of Saad Ibrahim. At mm -hmm. some stage, they released Ayman Nur before his time was up. Yeah. But um, so. Um, what do they react to? I mean, what do they react to? If they don't react to open pressure, do they react to sort you of... Mean the uh, government, the yeah, Egyptian the government? the Egyptian government. We are talking about President Mubarak and... and, and uh, How do his, they react uh, now? Yeah, I mean, what, what can the Obama administration do to sort of emphasize the idea of uh, democracy and how important it is for them without giving the impression that they are interfering in the affair of Egypt. We have this problem across the region, you know, so. This, this question is very important. Actually, we have to, to make an advantage of this warm relationship between President Mubarak and the new administration of Obama's administration. And um, Dr. Ali Din Hilal, he, he's one of the official uh, in the National Democratic Party. He mentioned that because of this good relationship when Obama came to office, President Mubarak ordered the release of Ayman Noor and, the re and to end uh, Saad Din Ibrahim 
uh, case and I came up with this naive quick quick question that means that Hosni Mubarak has a power over the judiciary. Mm -hmm. he, 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 he was a little bit confused, but he said, no, he just uh, speed up the process. What's needed from the Obama's administration is to take advantage of these two years, or to take advantage of the debates that's going in Egypt uh, regarding wh what's the rights, what's the people rights, how to reform, how to get, uh, how to change the constitution, how to um, uh, get a real uh, good ruler to Egypt in the next presidential. Uh, what is needed is to keep pressure, but. Uh, as mentioned or as advised from some uh, American expert is to keep it uh, in closed doors, to keep the pressure, to keep the pressure in two parallel lines from uh, uh, the, the pyramid model from top to bottom f to pressure on, on President Mubarak and to push or to help uh, the civil society in Egypt to adopt some, uh, some organizational skills. This is very important because we have several opposition parties, but everyone is trying without some kind of uh, organizing their effort and combining their effort to achieve something. Okay. Thank you, Roxana. Sure, I'll have everybody's name there. Roxana yes. Bahramitaj from uh, Just um, wait for the mic, it's coming, okay? Uh, Roxana Bahramitash from uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, thank you so much for your um, lecture. Um, I guess my question is that because of the um, recent global economic crisis, uh, we have two factors. I think one is that uh, the fact that the population of Egypt, like most of the Arab world, are very young and young population can afford, can, can be like a, a political dynamite. And the other one is economic, uh, current economic crisis. And I think that these two um, factors are very can be very destabilizing. Um, there are journalists, uh, including uh, people who write for the Economist, who are think, who are saying that the entire Arab world is in for a major change. And um, and and with regard to what you were talking about, the inverse pyramid, uh, there are I, I I think that many argue that there are substantive radical changes that are taking place. For example, women, uh, the Arab Human Development Report referred to women as a quiet revolution. And then there are more uh, uh, more dramatic um, changes. You said that 10 percent of 20. 3% who voted, uh, vote to Akhwan, but I think that if the more, pe more poor people voted, it might have been that the Akhwan had more uh, political together, I mean, together with Gemad, for example, who probably boycotted the election altogether. So it just seems to me that the future um, may be um, a little unstable, given the fact that the entire region may be experiencing um, a lot of changes. So I'm wondering what, um, what, sh what is the obvious question, what do you think about the future given all these factors? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. Actually, uh, there is this, I, uh, I agree with you that there is some fears of the Ikhwan, some fear of chaos, and, but actually the, the simple answer is the security forces in Egypt is very efficient is very, very efficient. And their first priority is to maintain stability. Having the, uh, the financial crisis, having young uh, generation or young people, this is, uh, this is a, a fatal uh, problem in Egypt that something around 25% of unemployment and uh, I agree with you, we have poverty, we have Ill illiteracy, we have several problems that is some kind of a bomb in Egypt. But again, it's the security or the security forces. On the other hand, um, regarding uh, El it's the fault is not coming from the people. Actually, El uh, uh, were very uh, skillful and clever in attracting uh, votes because of their services, because of the lack of the government services. They, they just withdraw from the Egyptian society and that was a chance for, for El Ikhwan to, uh, to take the advantage and give some uh, services and this 
uh, gain them some sympathy. The, the, the question or the answer to this question is to um, have a third party. It's, it's not either the uh, dictatorship or the or, uh, Mubarak's regime or Gamal Mubarak or whatever, and El Ikhwan. It's not a two choice that you have to make. There's, there has to be a third choice. And uh, the Egyptian government is preventing, putting several restrictions of uh, establishing uh, opposition party. We have several parties like El Ghad, like El Wasat, which can uh, be a third choice with the secular uh, uh, secular uh, uh, program and so on. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, the mic is right there. Sure. My name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm with a coalition of Egyptian organization, eight organization working here to lobby the American government. Uh, my, my question is the idea of Mubarak is very sensitive and we cannot talk to him certain way is, is bizarre to me. It's, I, I don't agree with the American government, and we said that in the State Department many times. It's, it's a joke. You have to have a principle and talk about the principle. Mubarak will, is a dictator, and he ruled in the country with about 100 family, and they want him to stay there. He probably, if he found a, any a peaceful best to go out with his money, the billions he have, question, he, he will please. go. My question is, how we can pressure Obama to speak out and say the principle of the United States, democracy, human rights, and not only uh, fail as, as he's doing right now? This is actually a very sensitive question because um, Obama is facing a lot of challenges in the States. He's, he's not willing to, to put all these problems aside and concentrate on the democracy in Egypt. That's why it's very um, disappointing. But what I'm, what I'm asking in my research is that it's either these two years or it's, or it's nothing. It's either working within two, these two years or you lose the chance. So we only have these two years of debates and pushing people to, to adopt democracy, to have some reforms. It's either these years or you lose, you lose the chance. Uh, yes, please. Uh, just the mic is no, no, you, oh, okay. <laughs> please. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Ibrahim Hussein. I am with the Alliance of Egyptian Americans, and I'm speaking for myself. I am Egyptian American living here in Washington D.C. In all your beautiful, wonderful presentation, near the end you listed. Uh, status of women, education, lack of freedom, uh, lack of opposition, lack of whatever, uh, free press is, is really absent. Where is the Egyptian people? Where are? Why don't they get up on the street like in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Iran for sure, in many other countries? I, I go to Egypt every couple of years, or once a year or twice every other year, but there is no interest in democracy. Am I right? Okay. Um, when you ask any Egyptian, any Egyptian man or woman, are you interested in democracy in Egypt? Are you, he'll, he'll, he'll quick response will say, yes, I want democracy. Democracy is wonderful. It's very good. The second question, are you willing to give up some time, some effort, some, are you willing to struggle for this democracy? He's not willing to do that. This is uh, uh, some kind of a problem in the Egyptian society. Uh, it's, it, democracy is not something that to be given. It's something to struggle and fight to get it. What, what is needed here is the civil society's activist. What, what is needed is support these civil societies, NGOs, um, all, all sorts of uh, uh, society activists and all this to attract people to attract people to struggle for the democracy this the lack of uh, organization is the only problem people only uh, uh, care for their daily uh, for their daily life for the the sake of their food and uh, expenses and looking for a job it's it's some kind of a higher 
uh, desire to 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 run or to to ask for democracy while you are suffering from several several uh, daily uh, problems. Uh, yes, please. Omar Afifi, President of uh, People Rights. Uh, Obama, Obama, Obama. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Why Obama help the people to change? That's the first. Why we think Obama have many tools to pressure? What can Obama do? What can Obama do? Obama have a lot problem inside. We must do the bend. Like uh, Mr. Ibrahim, he said, we must to depend for ourselves. Only thing we ask Obama to stop to support the dictatorial uh, system. Mm -hmm. You think Obama, you think Obama, he leave all his problem inside and Afghanistan and Iran and to go to, to change to Egypt? Why? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me let me. Um uh, answer you with something. I was covering uh, the presidential election in 2005, and it's usually uh, the NDP gathering people, all people from any governorate, to attend uh, Mubarak's uh, uh, presidential campaign. And there were there was that poor man, poor farmer who were wearing something very poor, and uh, his waving and yelling for President Obama. I want to ask him, how is, how is your life and how is your earning and how, how do you manage to live? He, he's, he, uh, he was suffering from a lot, dealing with farm, farming problems, ha doesn't have enough money to buy things for him, for his family. But all, in spite of all these poor circumstances, he's voting for Mubarak. That's why there is a difference between feeling injustice and being treated unjustly. Egyptian people are ignorant. 50% of, uh, of the population are ignorant. They have first to learn what's the rights, what's, what means to have a democracy. And then when they know what's the rights and they know how to learn to ask for the rights, then you can ask them to, to, to call for democracy. This is the upper end of, of call. They need to call for, uh, their first call was for raises in, in wages, as we see demonstration in the Egyptian streets. The, the standard of living, the daily uh, problems eating and working and on and, and, and these basics uh, needs first and then go up to freedom and to political reform and to democracy. Uh, excuse me, sorry, another question. Yeah, uh, just Hi, my name. It works. Hi, my name is Jason Stern from the Project on Middle East Democracy. You talked a fair amount about internal pressure on the regime. And this weekend, there have been two developments that would create more internal pressure. One being that Mohamed al Baradei announced he would only run as an independent candidate, which, according to the current constitution, would be almost impossible. And then two, the Kafea movement announced that they're going to boycott the elections. Um, could you please analyze these two developments in terms of how much pressure that puts on the regime and whether that will help the chancellor any reform before both the parliamentary and presidential elections? Thank you. Okay. Actually, uh, uh, the announcement of Mr. Mohamed El Baradei f to run for uh, um, presidency is, uh, was welcomed very much in the Egyptian society. And it was, before that, it was considered that Gamal Mubarak is coming and we have nothing to do with that. He's coming and you don't have a hand on it. Uh, what is Going now is with El Baradei announcement that he ran for presidency, and he 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 announced that he ran independently, that he won't be uh, on the list of any party, and that's because he doesn't trust any party's opposition, and this is actually almost impossible to gather some kind of 70, uh, 70, uh, 750 si signature or approval from. Uh, parliament members, um, governorates, and all these people are 
uh, under the uh, the supervision of the of the current regime so it's some kind of it's, uh, it's it's very hard we can say it's impossible but it's very hard but the debates that el baradai started to to emerge or this debate that it's not a taboo that it's it's just the the president or whatever the president will cho will choose after him it's open for all people it's open for for people to um, to ask to to call for uh, its rights or their rights um i'm i'm sorry what was the other question or does it answer your question the second yeah, part the of the Kafea movement announced they would boycott the elections. Yeah. Um, this is another another um, element that needed uh, to to be addressed, and the need to uh, um, international uh, monitoring uh, monitoring uh, to the elections. This is very important, and Egyptian officials always deny this international monitoring of the election because that's some kind, they explain it as some kind of a logistic problem. It's how come you, ha you are having a judiciary uh, um, over uh, monitoring the, government, the, the election and having another superior international monitoring the, the election. It's not, it's not something like that. You can work in parallel or you can work in cooperation or even the international monitors can can work under uh, the Egyptian judges. It's it's the end how the election process is is functioning. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Yes, please. Um, just. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sharif Mansour. I'm with Freedom House. Um, and the question of the kind of tools the U.S. government can use in dealing with the Egyptian government, many people raise the point of conditionality with aid. And recently, uh, people are talking more on positive conditionality, creating, giving more money for Egyptian government based on achieving some benchmarks on political reform. In your view, uh, conditionality as a whole, and specifically, positive conditionality is a good way to go for Obama administration or not? Uh, this is a very important question because aid was raised several times in Washington Post dealing with this issue about the relation between the two countries. And unfortunately, the, the Egyptian government realized that uh, the, the American administration needs Egypt and needs all the facilities that Egypt is uh, delivering regarding the uh, the peace process in in the Israeli Palestinian process, the all the uh, cooperation, military and investigation, and uh, all all the facilities that Egypt are providing, and the aid is not as as important for the American side as this military cooperation and peace process and these regional uh, issues that Egypt is helping U.S. in. Actually, uh, uh, there were some calls for some condition uh, about the U.S. aid to Egypt, and it wasn't successful. It ended up with this budget that was uh, recently announced from the Congress that uh, U.S. aid to Egypt is unconditional for 2010. What tools, what uh, Positive tools, it's, it's actually by praising, by giving more incentives, but, but it's, not, it's not going to be that effective. What, what's the effective issue is helping the civil society to, to form that pressure. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's not welcome, the pressure, the American pressure over the, the, the Egyptian government is not welcome through the Egyptian people. Egyptian people have suffered uh, for decades and for for uh, centuries from uh, foreign occupation. So these foreign ideas or these foreign American ideas of posing uh, a model of democracy, some kind it faces uh, resistance from the Egyptian people. Uh, it's some kind of a natural resistance from anything foreign. 
So it has to be from inside. And as long as the Egyptian regime is accepting uh, that calls for, for, uh, for reforms should be, should be coming from the Egyptian people. So we should help the Egyptian people to speak up and to realize their rights and to push and to form all pressure that is needed for, for this reform and for democracy. Uh, thank you. Please join me in thanking uh, thank you. for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.